Okay, hello and welcome to episode 61 of the Market Maker podcast. It's Friday and as ever, I'm joined by Piers Curran to just talk over the main topics of the week and some of the three key themes we're going to delve into. Of course, Elon Musk and getting onto the board of Twitter. What's the rationale? Why has he done that? Is he going to get in trouble again with the authorities? We'll discuss. Also want to take a look at the French election because if you're a student, or a trader in the UK, you probably really haven't paid too much attention to what's been going on there. But I'll explain the process and I'll explain uh, kind of what to look out for going forward, because we have seen some sensitivity in the French markets this week on the anticipation of that event. And then going to flip over to the Porsche expected IPO and talk about that in a little bit more detail as well. But to kick things off, Piers, as ever, how's it going? How's your, how's your week? How's your quarter been just in general i know we're uh eight days in but <laughs> how's my q2 been so far <laughs> how's the q1 session <laughs> been um yeah it's intense i mean i think there's so much going on i guess on that on amplifies side you know not, then not obviously not to mention everything going on out there in the world of well geopolitics and economics and markets and stuff but yeah it's been super intense on the amplify side yeah quite we've, we've got some cool new Cool new stuff coming down through the pipeline. Um, to, to, to give me, give me one, one of the like the cool conversations you've had with anyone over over Q one. Uh, well, okay, well, uh, well, something quite interesting. We've been um, we've been partnering up with the MOD, the Ministry of Defence. So, so what? They want me back. <laughs> my, my time at Amplified's done. Anthony Chung, Black Ops. <laughs> Guru, well, people can't see this, but that's why I'm always dressed in black. <laughs> um, no, we're doing quite a cool new thing with um, basically trying to help ex armed forces or current armed forces people pivot out of the armed forces and into financial services. So, the MOD, uh, we've done a deal with the MOD whereby the MOD are sponsoring uh, the training of armed forces personnel they're sponsoring the amplify training um and you know it's about these these guys obviously they've got some great core skills that are transfer that are transferable to well any sector right um but but certainly finance being one of those um you know being able to work under pressure um being you know super organized from an operational point of view Mm. got some phenomenal talent and so uh, yeah, it's just about upskilling them on the finance side. So getting crash course through all of our simulations to uh, get, you know, lift the lid on what goes on over here in the financial sector. And then, yeah, looking to get, get them placed um, at, at some of our partner partner banks. So, yeah. yeah, it's pretty no, cool. I'm, in, I'm excited for that. Love to get involved and see what they're, they're like. I know over the years I've had... Um, I have had some interactions which with training with some well, kind of different officer, uh, infantry and SAS. So it's right. been interested to see uh, over the years how they've how they've performed. And, and thankfully, they've all gone on to do actually quite different things. Uh, some some data security. Uh, one chap, which we both know, has a has a new app that he's, he's just released. So he's getting into the tech That's side. Nice. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great. But um, yeah, well, look, look forward to that. And uh, great to be spreading the mission then just beyond our, our kind of typical student university type demographics so yeah all for yeah. that for sure but um look let's get to the to the highlight reel of the week and going to start off with the russian ruble because you know you called this last week you were talking about the rationale and if you didn't catch that just go back to the last episode and listen to pierce he explains very eloquently how and why the Russian ruble has been recovering from the absolute bloodbath that ensued on the initial round of the first sanctions that hit the banning of SWIFT and so forth that we had a couple of weeks ago, because the ruble actually by Wednesday, it already retraced all of its losses. Um, So this comes as well, despite NATO foreign ministers been meeting this week in Brussels, they're talking about coordinating a new round of sanctions on Russia, just given some of the pretty awful things that were coming to light uh, this week. So yeah, at the moment, that's kind of, I guess, as it was from a, looking at it purely from a market's perspective uh, at this point, obviously the, um, the sanctions that come out of this as a potential response could be quite interesting. I did see, turned on my screens this morning, 
And I was like, looks a little bit risk off initially, dollar strength, the euro is coming off a bit. So I had a quick scan of the headlines and actually um, apparently the latest now is that the talks, the mood has changed given some of the developments that have come to light after the Russian exit around uh, the capital of, of Kiev. So it looked like we were heading in positive direction. Perhaps this has been a bit of a bump and there could be sanctions on the horizon. So we're still keeping an eye on that. Um, the other thing though, looking, let's, let's stick with a macro view for a moment. Um, so away from geopolitics was the Fed. We had the minutes, Fed officials weighing shrinking the balance sheet by $95 billion a month. So a little bit more aggressive than on the historical kind of patterns that they've done with this. However, market reaction, pretty tame, I would say, not too much of a lasting impact. Um, primarily because Lael Brainard, who's the Fed governor, um, who sits just under, if you remember, she was actually tipped as a potential replacement for Jerome uh, not yeah. that long ago. Um, she's a well-known leaning dove. And for anyone not aware of all the, the clunky market language, uh, dove just essentially means she would sit on the side of a, a board of individuals, in this case, the US Central Bank, who would err on the side of just being more cautious, more stimulative to the policy in action to support the economy. But she came out and essentially said on Tuesday, day before, of course, the minutes came out, um, that the central bank could start reducing its balance sheet as soon as May and would be doing so at a rapid pace. And so the markets definitely reacted to her. Yeah. Um, so I guess it was the blow was softened when when the the finer detail came out uh, the day after. Um, to the final two to touch on um, in China, things are kind of unfortunately going from bad to worse. The China services PMI fell to forty two in March from fifty spot two. That's a pretty sizable decline there, um, and that was for the month of February. <laughs> So it's going to yeah. get worse um, at this point. And actually, it's the lowest level since the depths of the lockdown that we had on the initial outbreak in Wuhan back in 2020. So I, I've been saying this for a couple of weeks now. I definitely think the markets are a little bit complacent about the disruption, the effect that this will have. Um, because as we, as we've discussed this many times on the podcast uh, of, of the reasons why. But yeah, I still think people should keep an eye on the developments there. Shanghai obviously has gone into citywide mass testing, kind of full-on lockdown at the moment. We've got a team out there. I spoke to some of them yeah. this week. They were saying how they were explaining to me was really interesting. Put me right back in that um, that manic period of when I remember going down at the time. It was uh, uh, I was in East Dulwich in in London, and it was I was I remember I think I texted you, and I was like, everyone's gone mad, like. <laughs> people were frantically shopping yeah. and like just grabbing anything they could get. Right. Cause yeah. they, it was like, it was sheer panic. Um, kind of like the toilet roll situation. And um, apparently yeah. in China, um, I, I probably shouldn't say this on air because the Chinese authorities might, might find me, but cancel, um, cancel yeah. you <laughs> might cancel me. But um, yeah, apparently because of the fact that they've never really, you know, that had to respond in the same way because it's always been quite uh, kind of very surgical and specific in their lockdowns. But yeah. actually now it's just citywide and people have panicked and you're, you're getting that play out on a local level, I think. And yeah, it's, I think- this Well, apparently, really just to add to that, apparently, like if you live in a kind of high-rise building, mm. apparently government officials are just coming along and literally just locking the front door. Like you literally can't get out you, you can move around in the building, I guess, but you, you can't get out, like, at all. And so from a food point of view, you just get what you're given. And apparently it just depends what, I don't know, weirdly, they had a, a massive rock load of um, celery. So apparently there was just suddenly everyone was trying to figure out, yeah, trying to Google cooking. search, <laughs> like, uh, recipes for using celery. and uh, yeah. But, yeah, I do agree that... I guess here in the West, we're not we're not really getting much coverage of this. I mean, I guess it's a function of the Ukraine Russia thing, which is kind of just dominating and saturating the media. So you're not getting their news from other parts of the world. And so yeah, I do think it's going under the radar and it'll probably 
progressively or, you know, as the economic data starts to filter through for the months that we've already had, like you've just said with that um, PMI, then I think people are going to wake up and go, oh, oh actually, hang on, um, this is a bigger issue than perhaps we thought. There was, a, there was an interesting measurement, just to finish on this, this story, about um, monitoring of truck servicing data between, I think it was distribution centers and the airport. And it wasn't right. so much about the, the manufacturing of these goods. It was about getting them to the relevant ports for then distribution internationally. And the rate of those at the moment is at 3% of what is a normal tracked rate. Oh, right? wow. So it's like you know, your supply chain problems. Yeah. I mean, they, it's still quite clearly evident. It's just so this inflation situation, you know, central banks having to go hard and, you know, doves flipping and all these types of things. I mean, yeah, going, yeah. going quick. My bigger now. concern is like all the, but like the Fed going super hawkish, mm. but if the Fed raising rates is not going to solve right. supply chain issues. I mean, that's just not, doesn't have an ability to control that. So yeah, you might end up with super hawkish, much higher rates, but actually inflation just stays high, um, it, you know, in the, through the summer, let's say. Mm. So, you know, it's definitely, it's a cock, it's a very bad cocktail of negative forces uh, for economies and markets. Okay. Well, look, let's talk, let's talk uh, meta platforms and then we'll move on to Twitter. Meta drawn up plans uh, came to light this week. They're going to introduce virtual coins, tokens, and lending services to its apps. Otherwise, uh, internally said to be known as the Zuck Buck. That's just tragic. I'm sorry. That's just that's just bad PR. Whoever said that should have had a word with marketing, and they should have locked that down. <laughs> you know, the guy is just not the you know. He it's shouldn't like, be the face of this. <laughs> like the Daily Star kind of headline writer that's kind of come up with that. Yeah. But, well, hit me. Yeah, What's the deal? What's well, going on here? Well, there's a couple a couple of angles I want to touch on. There's just I wasn't going to, but now you've gone there. The Zuck yeah. Buck. Okay. Um, I don't know. When I read that, I thought, yeah, tragic was definitely probably the first word that sprung to mind. The second kind of thought process I had was, hang on a minute, that... That, and I've got such a negative bias towards Facebook, right? That, that's my default position is a negative bias. And, and, I've, and I've had that for quite a long time. And actually, maybe this is an interesting point to make and, and where you need to be careful with that, or I need to be careful with that because I'm now conscious I have a negative bias. So therefore, I force myself to try and... Um, view new information about Facebook, you know, and, and try and judge it on merit first, rather than just my subconscious default, well, hang on, I'm going to take the negative angle on everything. Um, but I, I feel myself, my subconscious kind of kicking in and going next. So when I saw Zuckbuck, I'm like, oh, here we go. Another, and actually I thought, well, actually this is a good example of like a dictatorship where you got this guy at the top running the show and basically all his minions sit underneath and try and make him happy. And so some, some of the minions have come up with this great idea. Let's call it the Zuckbuck. And Zuckerberg sat at the top <laughs> going, ah, yeah, yeah, great idea. Let's go with that. You know, that was literally, that was the first kind of set of thoughts that ran through my head. And then I thought, hang on a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm victim of my own negative bias here. I need to kind of pull myself back from that and try and view this and look the zuck buck thing is actually just a nickname for it internally apparently they're not going to call it that well i hope they're not going to call it that but um but yeah i mean i think that there's a bigger story here because the other thing that i saw again where i immediately went oh god this is just um is the fact that this isn't going to be a, a proper crypto you know decentralized cryptocurrency it's going to be a currency that's controlled by Facebook. Um, and I thought, well, again, that's just another massive error. And, you know, you've got it all wrong, right? Initial reactions. But looking into it more deeply, there are 
uh, basically Facebook have been forced down this path. So earlier in this year, that they um, they tried to create a crypto proper decentralized cryptocurrency called DM, but they had to wind it down um, earlier this year. They actually sold the assets in that to a Californian bank called Silvergate. But basically, they they were forced to shut it down because the U.S. regulator refused to give that project the green light and the regulator were concerned about monetary stability and competition concerns. So basically, Facebook have tried to create a full-blown cryptocurrency for the metaverse. The regulator has clamped down and prevented it. It could be argued that Facebook are being unfairly dealt with by the regulator compared to the regulatory oversight that the other big tech firms are getting. But that, that's, a, that's a whole different can of worms. So let's perhaps not go down that path today. But so let's wind this back. So Facebook tried a cryptocurrency, they got blocked. And actually, um, the, the, so Meta's, uh, Meta's financial division, um, basically all the staff walked out after that. They're like fed up. We, we literally can't, our hands are tied. The regulator won't allow us. They had a big team and apparently they just all walked out. We can't do anything, we're out. Um, so what's left is the kind of skeleton staff that were left, and I'm sure maybe they've rehired, but now it's like, well, okay, we need to repivot. And what can we do? What will the regulator allow us to do? And basically, this is this is now that first kind of foray down that path. Um, so, and then, and then the other thing I've read, can you believe, and I forgot about this, do you remember something called Facebook Credits? I'll, no. I'll forgive you if you don't. No. <laughs> they, they launched this in 2009. And it was a virtual currency that enabled users to make in-app purchases. So you could use this in games like Farmville. I don't know if you ever came across yeah, that. Yeah. But they, they created Facebook credits in 2009, a virtual currency. And actually, when, when they... Um, when they IPO'd in 2012, their, their Facebook credits virtual currency made up 16% of their revenues. Oh. But they then shut it down in 2013 because it was too costly to maintain. So A, genius. I mean, so far ahead of its time. But then B, what an error. Hmm. Closing well, it I wonder. Day. I wonder when they shut that down, who was head of that division and where that person is now. Yeah, that would be interesting to see what they've gone on to do, because surely point. they learned the structure, the technology, right. the implementation, the team. They must have gone on to do something. That'll be a worthwhile half an hour trying to dig into hmm. to that and find that answer. All right. Let's or let's get let's let's give the, our listeners that job. Yeah, a bit of homework. Yeah, message us. Who used to run Facebook credits um, back in the early days? Okay. Email me, a.chung, C-H-E-U-N-G, at amplifytraining.com. We want name and current current role, current position. Yeah. Could be a little bit of merch in there for the, for the best response. All right, now we're talking. <laughs> well, look, let, let, let's, leave, uh, let's leave the Zuckbuck and talk about Elon. So jumping out of the frying pan <laughs> um, into another another heated uh, situation this week because yeah it was quite quite shocking really Twitter shares they just spiked um, I mean pre market they were about thirty percent early in the week they went about twenty five I think they've gone up about fifty percent it's transpired since this uh, stake accumulation coming from uh, the Tesla CEO but Elon Musk has tweeted his way onto the board uh, as well <laughs> of, of Twitter. And he's taken a 9.2% stake in the company. Now, I've read all sorts of headlines I've seen, you know, going around about why is he done this, and suspicious options activity and some irregularities in filings to circumvent certain responses from the SEC and things like that. Talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on? Like I saw, I, I shared a, a tweet that he did. He actually tweeted a meme, a very popular one of him. So he tweeted a meme of himself. Yeah. Just saying Twitter's next board meeting is going to be lit. And it's him <laughs> smoking a big cigar. 
<laughs> I was just like, this guy is just another <laughs> level. And this week, let me just get the percentage just, just for, a, yeah, Tesla shares are down over, over 10% this week. Tesla shares. Oh, wow. I didn't even look at Tesla shares. Right. I was so obsessed with, hang on, what's going on with the Twitter share price? Yeah. Right. So Tesla down 10%. Yeah. Well, makes sense, right? In that he's, wow, he just, I don't know. He's, he's, he's either just, he's just a rich dude who's bored. <laughs> right. That, that's one, that's one angle. Or, or, or there's something more. I mean, look, he's a clever guy, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say there's there's something more to this, well, some the, kind of thought out strategy. But so, so before you give me the details and some of the stuff I, I mentioned, one thing I did read in Politico, um, which I like getting from a slightly different and non financy type angle, they were looking at case studies of previous people like Bezos, for example, and others, and they were looking at this pattern that people like Elon who are very wealthy individuals tend to have with they get to a point in their professional corporate life where they start to then move into the media sphere right and start to pick up then and become this kind of media mogul force because yeah. then that gives them influence beyond that of which money can buy and so with right. Bezos buying was it the washington times or post and then washington the post moves. yeah and then so they were kind of speculating that 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 instills then a longer term um, immortality and their legacy because they then have this media outreach and, and control. And so that's what people at that level, you know, when you've got 300 bill in the bank account, yeah, that's what, that's how they, how they think. But I thought that was quite an interesting spin and one that makes sense, I guess. Yeah. Very interesting. I mean, I think the, the other angle to this Twitter thing is, or, or the Musk Twitter thing is, I mean, he's got, I don't know, it just looks really dodgy on one, if you're looking at it from one angle. And he might have multiple bill, but you can't spend it when you're in jail. He's got to be a little bit careful <laughs> here when, because the way he went about accumulating his, what is it, 9.2% stake in Twitter. I don't know, when you look into it, it's there's some pretty dodgy. Well, all I'm going to say is the SEC are definitely going to be very carefully looking into this. Um, and I, I would probably say quite seriously, because back on um, the 31st of January, um, Elon Musk owned zero Twitter shares. OK, he now owns eight over 800 million Twitter shares. Insane. And he started on the 31st of January, he started buying, and he pretty much was buying shares every single day, all through February, all through March. What 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 clip sizes are these? Do we have right? So I've got that? the full list here. So he so started off, he started off small, right? <laughs> in inverted commas. On the 31st of January, he bought 620,000 shares. Mm -hmm at $36.83 per share. So, I mean, you do the math on that. Um, what, what is that? That's like $18 million worth, is it? Um, so he started off with clips around five to 600,000, right? Then he got the bat out. And on March the 2nd, he bought 3.6 million shares. He bought another million on March the, oh, sorry, February the, sorry, February the 3rd, 3.6 million. Fe February the 4th, he bought another million. February the 7th, he bought 4.8 million. So really getting the bag. But all the clip sizes, bearing in mind he's buying every single day, the smallest clip size was 300,000. Uh, the next smallest then is a jump to like, there's a few at five and 600,000, but mostly it's over a million shares per day. So it's a question then, if you're a like a flow trader and you're looking at a stock like Twitter, surely it's quite yeah. evident there's a player in the market who's just absolutely building, accumulating a state. How did this not come out in the trading community for those stock watchers who are looking at this stock price? I mean, 
surely this is an abnormal behavior that would trigger a flag. It's a good, that is a very good question. I mean, maybe I think they were, we, and maybe they made, they just yeah, wrote, right, you know, exactly. just go, I'm just going to get behind the whale. Yeah. And let's ride it. <laughs> I mean, the share price, I mean, it did, it did, it was dropping. Certainly when you get to the sort of start of March, it was on the decline. Obviously we had that. It was, it was the phase where tech was getting, hmm. it was on a downtrend for, for sure. And, you know, obviously he was just propping up that slide. I mean, who knows? I think it bottomed out, Twitter bottomed out at about $33, right? If he hadn't have been buying, you know, obviously it's hypothetical, but we won't, we'll never know how much lower it would have gone in that downtrend. But he certainly w- was kind of putting the brakes on that downtrend. But it was buying any, about... Do you have any data well, on his tweets over right. these periods? Well, this exactly... So this is where it's super dodgy. Um, this, if I was the SEC, I'd just be putting my best team on this because here, here's the sequence, right? In terms of his twi- his tweets and so on. Um, so, well, look, on March the 14th, this was quite a key day because that was the day where his stake um, crossed the 5% threshold. Now you've got, there's certain regulatory filings you've got to do if you buy up more than five percent you've got to submit these various forms right you're supposed to do it within 10 days okay so on march the 14th so he should have it should have been submitted on march the 24th he should have disclosed his five percent plus holding on march the 24th he didn't disclose it until april the 4th now during that period he's still buying and buying and buying and buying right but he's also tweeting um so remember, he's got 80 odd million um, people on, on, on Twitter, right? On followers. Um, so let me just see. So like, for example, there's a few things here. Um, so on, the, on March the 24th, for example, he, he's tweeting. Um, well, he, he asked his Twitter followers for, for a poll, basically, on whether Twitter algorithm should be open source. Hmm. Um, he tweeted on the 25th, um, uh, Musk polls his followers on whether Twitter rigorously adheres to the principle of free speech. Hmm. I remember that. Then he, he, as he's tweeting that, he's buying three and a half million shares, I think. <laughs> oh okay. Um, he, then, he then said, um, he, uh, hang on, uh, a day after tweeting, so he then, he then tweeted that he's, giving serious thought to building a new anti-censorship social media platform. Basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch a rival to Twitter. He bought 2.6 million shares in Twitter the day he tweeted that. Now, I'm sorry, but that is seriously dodgy. You cannot tell me that he's not manipulating the share price using his platform and then on the side, just hoovering up. Um, Then of course, on April the 4th, it's announced, he files late, it discloses I've got more than 5%, share price up 20, 30%. His his average position, buying through day after day after day, accumulating 800 million shares, his average purchase price was $35.89 per share. Mm. It, the news then comes out, the share price pops to $49.97. So he's in at 35 and it's trading at 49. What's really interesting then, so there's different filings you've got to do, right? So there's something called a 13D filing. Mm. And that revealed that he had, well, he had a certain number of shares. And then there's another filing called the 13G filing, which he filed later on April the 4th, which actually showed he had less shares. So on April the 4th, news comes out. It looks like then the number of shares he owns is starting to go down, i.e. we're just starting to book profit. It looks like from one angle, this looks like he's just played the entire market. I mean, incredible. It's either the stuff of legend or he's going to prison. I'm not quite sure which one yet. I just wonder, if I was him, 
I'd be looking at the state of the US political system at the time of where we are at the moment, about to go into midterms. And I'd be saying, they can't touch me. Yeah. Because they're in disarray and they're going into a period where <clears throat> there's so much stuff to just, they have to do now. And it's so fractured on Capitol Hill. I'm going to do whatever I want. And you know why? Because I can do whatever I want because I'm the richest man in the world. Right. And it's going to be lit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can see the attraction because, you know, I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious what's happened here, but I don't think they can take him down. Yeah. Maybe he's so above them. Why not? I mean, it's not right, but hey, I mean, how do you get your kicks? When you're that rich. Well, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, well, look, on that, on that bombshell, um, <laughs> let, let's move on. What we'll do is we're going <clears> to <throat> dip into some, some uh, politics and then we'll come back out and then talk a little bit corporate finance just to kind of cover all bases. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll run through this quite briefly just to give you an overview of what's going on. And the reason why I wanted to cover this is that you're probably going to read about this at the weekend because it's the first round of the French election. French bonds slid quite sharply uh, earlier this week, sending the benchmark 10-year yield in France its highest level since 2015. Uh, the CAC 40, which is the main stock index in France, was also underperforming the rest of Europe. And it all came because obviously there's a lot of focus on polls. <laughs> we all know how inaccurate they tend to be, <laughs> but yet human behavior dictates that we're all drawn to it like a moth to the flame. And those polls have, have basically seen the two main front runners uh, converge, and that being that Macron's lead over the far right national rally leader Marine Le Pen has narrowed to just five points. Polls prior to this, the gap was plus 10 points. So, this is, I would say, though, this is, well, a couple of things. This is quite normal in the sense of in the French system, which I'll talk about in a moment, there's two rounds. And it's kind of an elimination process where they then go into a final presidential runoff. Now, one of the things here is that at the beginning, so let's say a few weeks, months out, everyone's kind of got a shot. And in the polls, it's kind of like the start of a horse race. Everyone starts at the same point. And then as you get closer to the finish line, you start to see a dispersion of the, the main kind of front runners in that sense. All the others who might look quite hot at the beginning and you think, wow, there's going to be a big upset voters' minds tend to get more channeled and focused as we start to get closer to the day of which then they get asked, who are you actually going to vote for? And people tend to kind of fall in line. And that's where more familiar characters often, um, I must say Macron was an exception to that with his new party when he last won. Oh, yeah. Um, but generally speaking, that's where more familiar characters tend to come to the forefront, just more broadly in politics. So a couple of other things. The first round then uh, on Sunday, it's very much expected Le Pen will make it through uh, to the 24th of April runoff. So the next part of this is not till the 24th of April. And a poll by The Economist um, has had her going through because Macron is expected to go through. He's far ahead of everyone else in the polls in terms of bar Le Pen. Um, they had Le Pen going through at 89%. So it's pretty much a, not going to say a done deal, <laughs> not that naive. <laughs> to say it's a done deal, but it's looking that way. Now, a um, couple of things then, I guess, of, of why we've had a convergence in the polls, because this is what I, I mean, kind of, what must be some, something going on here. And his position as president, I was reading, has prevented him from really campaigning. In fact, he only actually had his first campaign about a week ago. Why? Well, there's this problem in Ukraine that he's had to deal with. And he's been one of the main kind yeah. of brokers of the conversation. So he's been absolutely engaged on the geopolitical front, which has meant that he hasn't really been able to speak a lot to the electorate back home in, in France. And so while he's dealing with that, he's also like every politician, every incumbent is dealing with this incredible problem of the, uh, the cost of living debate, which is really um, the main talking point for every base in Western Europe at the moment, feeling the plight of, of just this rampant inflation that we have. So that's him. What about her? So um, the, her rise is linked to the situation of uh, Eric Zemmour, mm. uh, and who also comes from a similar political position, perhaps a little bit more 
far reaching, let's say, uh, in yeah. terms of views. But in January, February, he was credited with around 15% of voting intentions. Uh, but he's since fallen sharply. So Moore's candidacy tended to demonize Le Pen. But basically, uh, this is the risk I guess you run uh, as a candidate when you go down that angle. You either capture, really capture an unearth feeling and sentiment some might say kind of like trump might have done uh yeah. previous years or you go step too far and people go oh my god this is just too much and actually then as a strategic move le pen can appear as a more moderate, moderate. right-leaning candidate so now she becomes not the, even though she is the far-right leader she's a moderate far-right leader in comparison to now a reference point of someone who's way more out yeah. there um, well, and Eric Zemmour also, I mean, he's so extreme. He, he, you know, he was convicted for hate speech. I mean, he's, he's proper, super far right. And I think perhaps what unstuck him, other than maybe going too extreme, he, he, he loves Putin. He's a big Putin fan. Mm. And it's not a great period of time to be a Putin fan in, you know, in the West, yeah, and, and, well, look, that's the, um, I, I, and on that point, I'll come come back to that in a moment because that's a key thing that will come up in a few weeks. Um, my, my mind's thinking though, and I haven't researched his background enough. But if I was working for Le Pen as a strategist, I would be very much talking backdoor to Mr. Zemmour. Yeah, going okay. Yeah, you talk like that. That's mm. fine, actually. Yeah. You go for it. You have my backing, in fact. Carry on, yeah. And then let him do his thing to the benefit of, I know then I'll play tactically my card to my favour. So it'd be interesting. I, don't know, I wonder, these political things do make my head spin sometimes about all the backdoor deals that get cut. But oh, look, yeah. the, the tactically Le Pen, though, is said to have ran a pretty solid campaign. So this is the double whammy kind of problem that Macron has. He's been distracted. She's had more time more planning she's had more ability to hold big rallies she specifically toured towns and villages of france kind of similar i guess to you know if i think back because what what's clear to me it was 2017 when macron won last time and that was just on the coattails of the eu referendum of brexit and everyone was panicking about france frexit at the time which we thought was a credible risk turned out not to be the case um, but now, you know, part of the, the disconnection, I guess, between big cities um, comparative to then more, let's say, Middle England, in the case of what we had, in this case, towns and villages. So she definitely knows her audience in that sense. And she's tried to connect with ordinary people, fundamentally different from Macron. And this is then the next interesting part, because let's say the two go through to the final runoff which is very much expected to be the case. So current polls, what's important, the current polls do not say anything about the second round because what yeah. happens here is now, this is when the horse trading happens between the fallen candidates and Macron Le Pen need to be thinking, right, who can I strategically get to now vocally back me so that their supporters then fall under my wing? So that's point one. Point two, there's going to be debates between Macron and Le Pen. And again, I still remember those ones between Clinton and Trump. You remember when he was like stalking her around the stage? But the debates are always, always <laughs> interesting. And in the Macron Le Pen one, it's basically going to be played on two fronts from strategically president of the rich yeah. versus the Putin sympathizer. Right. Now she's backed off that very like recently, obviously. She's now the moderate far right. Yeah. But she's been a sympathizer in the past for some time. He has struggled for throughout with this kind of association with being friendly to the rich and himself being of that particular elite, let's say. And so this is the battleground. And that's really going to get quite dirty as it normally does. Interesting fact here is that no sitting president has been re-elected in France for two decades. Wow. Is that so right? um, I know I, I thought Nicolas Sarkozy was around for a long time, but yeah. he was 07 to 2012. 
And then he came. Then Francois Hollande came in, did his five years. Back. So Sarkozy, 07 to 12. Holland 2012 to 2017. Oh, Macron, okay. 2017 to now. So yeah, time, well, time flies, obviously. But, um, but yeah, so it's not that... So I guess the point I'm making from that statistic is that in recent times, right. the French public are not afraid to shift leadership um, in that sense. Um, final point here, and then, then we'll jump to Porsche, but it's worthwhile remembering them the analysts at ING were pointing out that presidential elections are followed by legis legislative elections on the 12th and 19th of June. And that will determine the parliamentary major majority and whether the president elect will actually be able to implement their program. And at this moment, this is what this is what people I think forget because the media have such a fanfare. If Le Pen wins, it's like, oh my goodness, like. You know, she's going to withhold payments in the EU budget. She's going to have questioned the supremacy of EU law. She's going to uh, intensify border controls. That will be the spin. Yeah. But in actuality, what can she do if you haven't got control on the, the legislative kind of um, elections and you don't have power? You can't do anything. So that's quite key. And actually, at this point in time, Marine Le Pen's chances of having parliamentary majority which is yeah. what you need to have passage of your proposals is extremely low so just a caveat there but from a trading investment perspective that doesn't mean that in the interim period you don't see increased positioning for the prospects of heightened volatility so yes. typically you know if she wins you would anticipate euro weakness um, an increase in uh, French spreads or widening in French spreads against the benchmark and a high yield so forth in the interim period. Um, so yeah, that hopefully that just gets, that's just a short soundbite to get everyone on point of what's going on, on with that. But let's get you back involved and let's talk about Porsche. Um, poised to be one of Germany's biggest ever IPOs, but I, I was kind of like, okay. And then I saw hmm, they've chosen... Goldman's Bank yeah. of America, JP Morgan and City. Like, how has that happened, firstly? But look, talk yeah. to me about why these book, you know, kind of coordinators are important, that process. And then yeah. let's talk a little bit about the deal and rationale itself. Well, so when you're going, well, when you decide, right, let's let's go public, let's list on the stock exchange, let's have an IPO, then of course, you know, you need some bankers to help facilitate that process. Now, when you go in, you're a company the size of Porsche, then you don't just need one bank, you need, you need several because the amount of stock that you're issuing and selling is so huge that you're going to need multiple banks to kind of mop that up and, and kind of get access to multiple banks, you know, customer books and so on. So, you know, it's about choosing the right banks. And historically, you know, the big you know, big European IPOs, um, historically, you know, you choose European banks, you choose your home team, right? Mm. And especially in Germany, by the way, especially in Germany, um, you know, Deutsche Bank, it, I mean, Deutsche Bank, it would have been like a shoe in given right there, actually the lead, you know, you know, going back through the years, Porsche IPO, Deutsche Bank, right? Bang, done. It's not even up for discussion, except that Deutsche Bank are not involved at all. And Volkswagen have said, well, you know what? We've just, forget geography here. We've just gone, right, leading investment banks of the world, pitch to us, what have you got? And we just chose it on merit and they chose four Americans. Um, so they chose Goldman's Bank of America, JP Morgan and Citi. So, you know, quite amazingly, not one euro. So no Deutsche Bank, obviously, but then no Barclays, no BNP Paribas, you know, the other big kind of European giants. No. And I guess there's a couple of reasons why Deutsche Bank um, quite controversially ha haven't been in the running here. Number one is, and I think I guess this is a function of where US banking has suffered more, sorry, European banking has suffered more than US banking. Over since the financial crisis in 08 and 09. 
Okay, and that's because Europe almost like had a double crisis. It wasn't just the financial crisis, then there was the Eurozone debt crisis. Um, and so it's almost been a double whammy. And as part of that, um, these banks have had to divest a lot more than US banks. There's been a lot more, you know, bad debt. There's been a lot more restructuring. There's been a lot more divesting and streamlining. And so what you're ending up with is these big European banks that are a lot slimmer, like Deutsche Bank now, they don't have an equity trading division. And that right there is a big problem. If you're trying to shift a massive IPO, you know, having an equity trading division is pretty critical for facilitating that smoothly, right? So that's probably the biggest reason why Deutsche aren't aren't in it here. They, they've had to streamline themselves so they're not really fit for purpose anymore. Secondly, um, you know, it's about, I guess, Deutsche are, well, well, they've got about, they've, they've had a go at trying to get rid of some automotive IPOs in the past. And let's just say it hasn't been uh, particularly smooth. So for example, they floated, they were in charge of floating VW's truck unit, Traton, in 2019. And the share price is way below what the IPO price was. Secondly, Deutsche, one of the lead runners on Aston Martin's IPO, mm. which has quickly become the perfect case study, like the masterclass in value destruction. You know, it's definitely like go to business schools now mbas it's like the case study of a disaster of, of an ipo like up there with like facebook's actually but that's for different reasons but so reputationally deutsche trying to lead um, automotive ipos they don't have a very good track record so it's so anyway so these are the reasons and actually just step outside of this one deal for a second this is crazy this stat jp morgan has acted as a book runner on 223 European IPOs with a combined deal value of $45 billion since 2008, okay? So since 2008, 223 IPOs, 45 billion. Um, Deutsche Bank, over the same period, just 131 deals worth 28 billion. And these are, these are European IPOs. Right. So JP Morgan have almost doubled Deutsche Bank's activity in European IPOs in the last 14 years, which tells you the whole story, that the US banks are bossing it and they're on a level above. Uh, and the Europeans can't really do much about it. So, so one of the things that I was looking at was how, I think it was Fiat spun off Ferrari to become right. a list. And I actually remember one of the, our, our summer analysts that we had probably 2015 he went to goldman's and he was working he was an equity research analyst on ferrari on that you see that <laughs> you've pretty you've much landed made. it there haven't you <laughs> <laughs> come out to italy come and meet the team tour of the factory you know get the merch it's like yeah, let's uh, hit the track do you want to test that <laughs> some of our kit yeah <laughs> But yeah, because that, that's why I remember that, that period. But I was looking at, because uh, I guess one of the things when it comes to listing is about timing. And I know we've talked a lot about the EV, but I guess, look, top level, is it, I guess, is it a better time? Because the EV boom has kind of come off the boil a bit. Yeah. The EV direction of travel is still the same. We're right. definitely heading that way. But is it better value now to, to, to go now? specifically on the next I, period. Yeah, I think, and well, so we don't know when it, exactly when yet, but now, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's much more likely to happen now, 2022, we're not quite sure when, but yeah, I reckon they, I, th I think it's perfect in that they're kind of all buying the dip, so to speak, from a sort of valuation point of view. We've been through the initial uh, EV valuation bubble hmm. that has burst. Just go and have a look at Rivian's share price. What are they trading with you these days? Uh, uh, that's a good question. Why don't I quickly look it up whilst I'm uh, talking? But um, so they've kind of ridden through the bubble bursting. And now it's like, right, valuations are now, investors are now, right, let's 
now take a little bit more time over our due diligence and analysis and let's, you know, they've had their fingers burnt on the more speculative stuff. And now they're looking for proper automotive companies with a track record uh, with a you know infrastructure in place to manufacture and distribute, and this is where the likes of Porsche are perfect, right? And secondly, the valuations are more modest, which in the early days is good, right? Because what you want when you're IPOing is all right a valuation, but you want to make sure that then you're beating forecasts. You know, after year one, do you beat forecasts? Great. If you do, investors are keen; they'll buy more. This is how you get an upward trending share price post IPO. You know, it's about a more modest, more modest. It's just a realistic valuation. Just looking um, at Rivian. Oh, my goodness. Like, oh, my days. That is, I didn't realize. Yeah. Oh, my, that is. Well, at IPO, I'm looking at it now. IPO at 100, right? Or, or sorry, it, it hit the stock market at 100 bucks, spiked to 170. Are we looking at the same chart here? Uh, yeah, but I've got it up at 130 initial pricing, and then it's down at well, sub 40. Sub 40. So that's that's what I mean when the bubble has burst. Look, I, I was talking about it at the time. You know, go go and listen to our podcast. I mean, it was one of the most, it was the most visible bubble mm. I think I've ever seen. Um, anyway, it burst. So now it's good timing. <laughs> For, for, for Porsche. Um, yeah, and, and, then the, that and then strategically... Or for Volkswagen, um, I should say. Right, we were talking... Or is it Porsche? <laughs> so we were talking about, um, during the bubble, we talked about Volvo and a Polestar. And I, I mentioned Polestar to you offline because I got pushed some adverts. Kind of shows my age, I guess. They're pushing Volvos at me. <laughs> shows I've fallen now into the 40-year-old demographic, I guess. Um, but... We were talking at the time that Polestar was going to list and be valued at more than actual to Volvo Group, which is insane. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things I saw in a Bloomberg article, just when I was kind of researching for this pod, was that Ferrari, um, Ferrari's enterprise value trades at more than 22 times earnings. VW's yeah. 1.8. That's crazy. That's crazy. One, so, well, this is so why are VW looking to hmm. kind of spin off or, or IPO Porsche? This is for one, one reason. It's about trying to, you know, really access those much higher valuations that, you know, publicly listed, you know, more premium brand um, automotives uh, are seeing. And especially with their EV play. I mean, Porsche, Porsche is the most profitable part of Volkswagen by the way, just a great story. And they, they've got history here in, in getting the, reinventing themselves. They pivoted towards the SUV early on um, before any other kind of more, let's say, luxury brand um, automotive did. And they make you know, more than half of their revenues for, through their SUV um, series, Porsche. And they, they were trailblazers ahead of the game and now every, every other luxury brand has an SUV as a result of the success that Porsche had. Now they're kind of pivoting P to EV, um, which, is, which is looking like obviously a very successful uh, strategy. Um, so this is kind of why. But what's, what, what I really like, or what's really interesting about this is the, it's the kind of the backstory and the company structure. Mm. Like who owns Porsche? Well, it's Volkswagen, right? But then who owns Volkswagen? Well, it's Porsche. And you're like, what? <laughs> so basically in the 1930s, this, 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 the Porsche and Piesch families mm. started an automotive company, okay, called Porsche. <laughs> This is back in like 19, they founded Porsche in April, 1931. Okay. But then also uh, the, the, so there's a difference between the Porsche family. Let's just met, separate this out. There's the Porsche family and then there's the Porsche automotive vehicle company. Okay. The Porsche family have the majority control of Volkswagen. 
They don't own that. They own, well, they own 31.4% of Volkswagen, but they've got 53.3% of the voting rights. So the Porsche family control Volkswagen. Volkswagen owns 100% of Porsche. So it's a bit incestuous, let's just say, right? The Porsche family own Volkswagen and Volkswagen own Porsche. What's happening here is Porsche, sorry, Volkswagen are now spinning off Porsche while they're selling 25%. Or well, they're going to if the IPO happens, I should say. So they're looking to list and sell 25% of the Porsche Automotive Company, um, which means Volkswagen will still wind up owning 75%. Um, and, and the Porsche family, I guess, will end up owning 25% of the Porsche Automotive Vehicle Company. <laughs> and you can see straight away, this is already getting massively messy. So from a corporate governance point of view, this is, this is their one banana skin. This is a really tricky one. Because when, when it comes to the Investor Roadshow, you, know, you want to set out a great sort of opportunity for investors. It's got to be all clean cut. You've got to be everything. All your ducks have got to be aligned. There's got to be no kind of skeletons hidden in any closets. And you know, a clean governance structure really helps with that. But this governance structure is super complex. Um, and so that's going to be that that'll be their kind of headache in, in but I, I think it I mean look I, I don't think it's going to scupper the deal by any means that Porsche is a great company they've got great performance down the years they've got a great lineup of exciting you know an exciting pivot to EV it, it's Volkswagen's golden child and you know there's going to be plenty, plenty of demand for this but yeah, there's just that slight governance um, sort of risk lurking in the background. Well, uh, on that note, let's uh, let's wrap up this week's episode. Um, thank you, everyone, for for listening as ever. And yeah, thank you, Piers. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week. Yeah, have a good weekend. See you.